folks still sleepy? Okay. Well, he used 10 of my slides already, so that saves some time. <laughs> so I'm just uh, going to talk about the importance of uh, state societies. Uh, some people think that they are so independent, there is no relationship to the <coughs> ASIP. It is like telling your parents that we don't have any relationship, we are independent, we are rich and filthy rich. So that's what happens here. So we, we can't kill our parents just because we are prospering today. The same thing happens here. So that is my, that was my disclosure. I really don't take any money from anyone except that my major conflict is I spend too much of money, too much of time, too much of energy on ASIP. That is my wife's complaint. <laughs> so, historically speaking, how did we get here? ASIP was started in November of 1998. So, why did we start ASIP? Because the necessity, it was needed. If we didn't start ASIP in 1998, they issued a rule. All the interventional procedures were going to be removed from the ornamentarium, except epidural injections, only the interlaminar epidural injections and trigger point injections. And today, I hear all these people doing 30 procedures per day five days a week, 25 procedures in the morning, eight radiofrequency neurotomies. I'm not sure how it is literally possible, but people are doing that. We forgot where we came from, why we are here. The ASIP's goal in, at that time was to preserve the interventional pain management through advocacy, political means. Education started later. <laughs> it was just a side effect or unintended consequence. So now we are focusing more on education. So it is important to focus on the advocacy part, to preserving it. I will show you a few other things in a minute. So what was available at that time? American Society of Anesthesiologists, American Academy of Pain Medicine, and you have the American Academy of Pain Management. You, will, you can be board certified being a Nurses, nurses aid, you can get a board certification from them. You pay the fee, you get a certificate. A lot of people own, own those, have those certificates. How many of you are certified by American Academy of Pain Management? Pain so medicine. there, American Academy of Pain Management. Okay, I'm repeating. American Academy of Pain Management, which is called Integrative Pain Management now. How many of you are certified by that? If you still have it, I would recommend that you take it out of your CV and destroy the certificate. It is, doesn't give you much credibility. Regional Anesthesia Pain Society, Texas Pain Society, and Connecticut Pain Society. I didn't find out about Texas Pain Society until I met Dr. Raj afterwards and was talking to him. And Connecticut Pain Society, after I started talking, when I sent him a letter for the ASIM, David Cloth called and he was so excited that there is somebody else who is working for that and he was working in the state. But when I called the American Society of Anesthesiologists, they said, we, we cannot do anything for you. It all has to be done through their pain committee. Then American Academy of Pain Medicine said, we were not ready for <coughs> prime time. What the hell are you talking about? Prime time, we are going to be gone. <laughs> prime time. We are not ready for extinction. That was my goal. They were saying we were not ready for prime time. So that is when we started. The guy who helped me to start the organization was wrong, right? No, not really. <laughs> so this is the Patrick Morisi. He is the Attorney General of West Virginia now. Is running for attorney in the Senate. So I was I trying to hire him as a lobbyist. I heard his lecture and then I tried to hire him as a lobbyist. 
there is going to be said, oh, lakhs you need to have a society and you need to have some people for, to help you with. I said, where do I get the society? Who the hell is going to come to me? I'm from Paducah, Kentucky, foreign born, and nobody knows me. <laughs> no, I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> there can be people. But then he gave me an idea that anybody can be a member. So guess what? The next day I found the society and 54 of my employees became the members. <laughs> Other than three doctors we have and everybody. So we had a society with 54 people. <laughs> to improve the membership, we wanted to have an annual meeting. That is how the education started a little bit. Until then, it was completely political, 100% political. So at the annual meeting, by that time, we had 257 members. <laughs> So that is uh, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. This is how the philosophy is, frenemies. Do you know what frenemies is? Being friends with enemies, that is frenemies. So today we don't see that. We see on one side Trump criticizing the Speaker of the House, the, uh, the Democratic leader, right? They used to work together, like Obama didn't get along with the Speaker of the House. They never got, they don't get along anymore. They don't talk to each other anymore. They talk on TV. They just criticize. But these people, they used to have a drink every Wednesday evening. They, when they told, roasted for something for Tip O'Neill, he was the main opponent for Reagan. But even then, he helped him to raise some funding for $200 million. And at that roast, he said that, even though I don't really like him, but we are very good friends. <laughs> and he said, if <coughs> we die, and he's going to go to hell, I'm going to go to heaven. So I'm going to throw away my ticket to heaven. I'm going to go to hell with him. That is the type of relationship they used to have, which we don't. So how did we come up with this idea of the state societies? So we started in 1998, in 2000, they started saying that you can only do three epidurals lifetime in Kentucky. So I talked to the Medicare director, I didn't even know, but I got there and talked to him. Medicare director, he said, well, you can't do much. You have to be on the CAC. You need to be a member of the CAC. I said, what is that? <laughs> so I came to know what CAC was. <laughs> After that, we found out who the member was. I talked to the member. He's a friend of mine now. But he said, yeah, there's, there's nothing there. Why do we need to do more than three of you? Okay. <laughs> So I uh, kept talking, and it so happened, who appoints you to the CAC? <coughs> then we didn't have a specialty designation either at that time, interventional pain management. We didn't have CAC membership. But president of Kentucky Medical Society was from Paducah. So he called me for something, and we started talking. And he said, I asked him, hey, I was joking. Why don't you appoint me to CAC? He said, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, career advisory committee, and you have the authority to, really? And after 45 minutes, I receive a letter <laughs> appointing me to the CAC. <laughs> so there I become the CAC member of Kentucky, but as an anesthesia CAC member. So that is how we started. Then they said you need to have a state society if you want to have a CAC membership. So we started with state societies. We started all the states and everything. Then we changed the law later on. This comes a little bit later on, how they should be appointed. It is the state's medical society, that is how it was. Then we got the law changed to state speciality society. <laughs> so we started the state societies. Here it is. Tip O'Neill, all politics is local. It is not all education is local, it is all politics is local. So we have to work out our own issues related to the state, not 
the nation worldwide. ASIP can come and help your state issues. You have to do your own state issues. That is where Kentucky Society of Interventional Pain Physicians was born. That was the first state society we started. And after that, Andrea Prescott was very actively involved in ASIP. I asked her, so she went ahead and started the society in Florida. Texas and Connecticut were already there, and nobody was moving forward. Nobody wanted to spend the thousand dollars required. So I put my own money of fifty-two thousand dollars and incorporated in 50, 46 states. If you go and look at it, I have this many corporations under my name. <laughs> so that that leads to a few other problems. Now there is a DOJ investigation about contributions you receive from opioid industry. So we thought we never had any contributions from them, and then we looked at it. And we did have a couple of contributions for the exhibits. So we submitted that. We had to go through, it took us six hours of work to find over 20 years contributions. Now they want us to know, submit all the state meetings. Sometimes people have just dinners. They don't report to ASIP. But DOJ is saying that it is our responsibility we keep the records of the state meetings. Some of the state people don't even tell us what they are doing. And we really don't have time. Everybody is independent and they can do it with this collaboration as a, within the ethical regulations. So that is what was called, today we call it LCD. What was it before? LMRP, Local Medical Review Policy, when I got involved. In 2003, 2004 we wrote a major policy for interventional pain management that was adapted by 32 state Medicare and until this MPW came and destroyed everything. And today, we are going backwards and trying to fix the things. <coughs> so now you should know. <coughs> what Career Advisory Committee is, what it means, because we're going to take an examination at lunchtime, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps you to participate in the development of an LCD in an advisory committee. You don't have authority, you're just an advisor. You can discuss and improve administrative policies to exchange information between physicians. It is an educational tool, but it is an extremely important tool. This may be just a suggestion, a guideline, but when you go to court, when they want your money back, when they want to send you to jail, trust me, I'm not going to visit you there. So, <laughs> slammer is the word we used to use. That is the thing they are going to use. That is the document, LCD. There is also an NCD. It is a national coverage determination. We think that, wow, we, we need to get an NCD. Boy, you are dead. If you get an NCD, you are dead. It is never covered by anyone in the country, including Puerto Rico, anywhere. That procedure is gone. You get a national coverage determination. So, we worked hard and hard. We went through the legislation and got the membership in the CAC. After 46 years, our interventional pain management became a member of the CAC. Now, from each state, we can have two members. So it doesn't say they have to be appointed by ASIP or, or one of the organizations. It says state organization of interventional pain management. Now everybody's coming and claiming credit. We got a lot of opposition for this, but we have to do sneakily under the table kind of maneuvering we got through legislative maneuvering. This was helped by Anne Northrop, who was the congresswoman from Louisville. Actually, Vicki Glisson, I'm going to have a fundraiser for her tonight, is running for that seat now. So we started this Ohio Society in, in 2001. The two people I knew was Robert Masson and Gwen Bellamy. I asked them, do you want to do something with OSEP. They said, sure. 
So one became the CEO and one became the president. And after that, <laughs> we progress. We are doing very well now today. After that, we also got the interventional pain management definition. This is what interventional pain management is. We were careful to include every one of them. You see, we included with the application of interventional techniques, independently or in conjunction with other modalities of treatments. That is the, our specialty designation. We had to go through lots of politics and so many things for that. Opposition among our own organizations. Nobody wants other organizations to succeed. Nobody wants you to succeed. Interventional techniques. This is the definition we got from MedPAC. Med we worked hard to be inclusive, get so many things included in the definition. So, placement of drugs, just not just the injections, ablation, laser, or endoscopic discectomy. This was just an idea from one of uh, my friends from Alabama. He said, oh, Lax, we need to have endoscopic discectomy. We, may, we will be doing that in the future. I kind of didn't believe him, but I thought I, I wanted to work by consensus, so I thought that was a good idea. But today, that is one of the major things upcoming for others. And spinal cord stimulators, pumps, etc. There are lots of successful state societies, Georgia, Florida, New York, and New Jersey, California. New York, New Jersey is the largest one, West Virginia, Ohio. We also have a combination of Midwest societies. Then Texas. Texas is an independent society. They do have affiliation with us. They get all the benefits of ASIP, but they are independent. There will be more collaborations because each individual state cannot work. So the main purpose of these meetings is for you to understand the importance between a state and national issue and collaborate among yourselves to manage the state. So it is 60% political, 40% education. More of the politics, more of the advocacy. We have to focus on, like in Ohio, you need to learn to go to Columbus. One of these days, Rick or Amol, they're not going to be here. Somebody else is going to be running. This is what you need to learn. You need to learn to go to Frankfurt. Go ahead and lobby for the issues in Kentucky. So those issues are extremely important. You can't get that done by talking here, just criticizing among ourselves and blaming everyone else. Like we have this thing called failed surgery syndrome, <coughs> failed back surgery. Have you ever been to a neurosurgery meeting? They always talk about failed epidural syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so, those are the goals of the ASIP, and that is what he was talking about, and so I'm going to skip through those things. So we are talking about education, publications, certification, and advocacy, but for a state society, Advocacy is the major important one. ASIP is the organization. We are doing all these things. We are promoting. As I said, it is a consequence we had to do. When we went to the legislature, then they said there is no proof. There are no guidelines. So we started writing the guidelines. Then they said there is no evidence. Then we started doing studies. We had to come up with the evidence. So this is how each other feeds on each other. They're all important aspects. Then they said there is no credibility for what you do. You have to create a board certification. There are already boards. Then why do you need another board certification? <laughs> there are people who were not board certified. They do, do not have a primary board certification. They miss the mark. But they have an opportunity to go to go through a bit and get the board certification. That is the reason why we created that. Nobody would publish our articles. <coughs> they say that interventional pain management is a basement speciality, has no credibility. And actually, one of the famous people who became a president of one of the major societies told me in 1997, it was voodoo medicine.
So the strength of the ASIP is, remains in the membership. So it is the state and national membership. Without the state, you can't be national member. You have to be state and a national member. So collaboration on policies, collaboration on reimbursement, on education, outreach. <coughs> we also have this NIPM QCDR where you can report your data into the registry and meet the criteria for that stupid meaningless use and don't have to pay money for that. So these are the states, two state societies here. We have all these leaders. We need to get to know them. So how many people are from Ohio here? All of you are from Ohio. Some from Kentucky. Any from West Virginia? So we have two senators, Rob Portman and Sherrod Brown, and all the members of the Congress. So whether they are a Democrat, a Republican, or if you're a red state, blue state, pink state, or whatever, purple state, everybody has an influence. They have an obligation to you, just like we have an obligation to the society. We all have an obligation to ourselves and society. The same, they have an obligation to the members of the state. So if you are doing ethical and necessary appropriate stuff, you should be able to get their help on various issues. That's why you need to know them. You need to get involved with them. So this is ours, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul. I know all of them from, I know half of them from Ohio, but I know each and every one of them in Kentucky, along with their cell numbers and spouses' names and their cell numbers. So <laughs> it's very important. When you can't reach the congressman, if you have his wife's number, if you can reach her, our husband's number, that is the best way to do it. So, <laughs> so we, have, we are facing a lot of issues. Some of them are state related, some of them are the national. Medicare advantage or disadvantage, as you put it. Unless you have a local coverage policy, they don't cover your procedures. So that is another route they are going by. That is not what law says, but that is how they are interpreting. So we need to have a local coverage policy for almost everything. We have a non-coverage policy for adhesiolysis because they say we don't have evidence for that. Probably that is the best evidence we have is the adhesiolysis procedure. Elimination of regional limits. There's, we, I, we created this per region limit in 2003 now, MPWK, and they came up with only lumbar policy. They never did the cervical and uh, thoracic policy or sacroiliac joint policy. So now they put this small line in there. It is for whole body, not only for lumbar. You got, it looked like you got more. You have to be really careful. If somebody is giving you, you go to the bank and ask for a loan for $400,000. That is what we had, four, limit of four, but they want to give you $600,000. Is something wrong there, right? Why are they doing that? So that is what happened. Now they are taking it away, everything. Now they are saying that all six are for your whole body, not for the region. Private carriers and Medicaid. Now, CRN impact is, uh, were you here? How many of you were here yesterday for the discussion? I don't want to repeat everything, but they, they are getting the doctorate, they got their approval programs, they have started fellowship programs, so then they are saying that the only thing now we want is Medicare to approve, CMS to approve that their fellowship is equal to fellowship at Cleveland Clinic or one of these fellowships, so any fellowship physicians are going through. Forget about your $385,000 loan you come out with. Forget about your 13 years of education. Forget about your MCAT. Forget about your 13 years of education compared to their seven years. We are all equal. No discrimination. <laughs> now state issues, boards of medical licensure, Medicaid, workers' compensation, personal injury. 
practice regulations, private insurance policies, there are many of them. So you need to work with your state the governors and like Amol is on a multitude of uh, committees here. Uh, we have very good relationship with the administration. It doesn't matter whether they're Republican or Democrat. I work with everyone. So we are not Republicans, we are not Democrats. We are what? Escipians. <laughs> that ACP is our party, Escipians. <laughs> So you have to strengthen the state societies. I just wanted to focus on one thing here. We can do all these things, uh, what Rick was saying, and we have met organizations to contribute for you. You can become a champion. If it's a physician corporation, you can contribute over 25,000, individual 2,500. So these are all the opportunities to, to contribute to the society. So there is a, we are, working with the surgery center societies. This is our surgery center organization. We are going to, in the next lecture, I will show you what we are achieving in that aspect. We have succeeded in that to a great extent. I won't take credit until Trump signs the bill. So, but we are on our way there. All politics are local. This is the fundraiser we are going to have. But when you are looking at the goals, what he was showing, I will emphasize the next time, avoiding eliminating fraud and abuse. That is going to be our major issue going towards next year and next four years. We have to be extremely careful to preserve the speciality, not just making the money. People have forgotten that there is a patient exists. Only thing they have known is in the cup, the gold, and put a needle. So when somebody was saying that he does 100 procedures a day, how can you do 100 procedures a day? Well, explanation is he has six nurse practitioners. And so he's putting 100 needles. Do we know why he's putting those things or she is putting? Do we know the indications and medical necessity? Do you know the patient? Did you have time to talk to the patient? Did you ever shake hands with the patients? So we have to get over these things and we have to develop our own patient relationship. That is the best thing you can do is, that is the most advances in medicine is examining the patient, having a relationship with the patient. Thank you, I'm already two minutes over.